Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Three members of the Goon Squad are in the house today. One's and the there. guy that couldn't figure <laughs> out how to use the internet on the Page Semenza podcast last week is the um I don't on know, the controls. producer. On today. the controls. Yeah, I'm on the controls. I'm in charge of uh I mean clicking record basically. It's a big job. Um, so you know it's a big job. I can hear you guys. I can see you guys. I think we're fine. I think it's it's gonna go well. So slightly like better uh, Wi-Fi from there. Yep. <laughs> uh, slightly, better Wi-Fi. slightly slightly better Wi-Fi. Uh, <laughs> on today's episode, we are going to take a deep dive into nutrition, hydration, and body composition for the sport of CrossFit. Uh, before we get into that, you can head to sharpentheaxco.com. Uh, use the code word page P A I G E. You save 10% on your order. Page gets 10% towards her CrossFit games journey. Properfuel.co. Use the code word misfit and obviously misfitathletics.com for your individual programming needs and teammisfit.com for your affiliate programming needs. Before we get to the nutrition, hydration, and body composition, as always, we will do a little bit of life chat. Um, my story for life chat probably would go better if Ted was here because there's more context, but he's going to have to listen to this anyways to like, I don't know, whatever, he, he chop it and, you know, take Ted's out all the big, dumb shit Ted's a big say. Misfit podcast listener. For one <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if anyway, he has yeah. definitely I mean, he logged has listened the, mo- to the, mid, the most Misfit most podcast. Hours. He sits through it and then edits it after. He has to listen to every podcast twice, I think. <laughs> blessed uh so um i was on vacation last week um and there was this lovely sunset over cape cod bay so i bust out my drone um and basically just turn it on and fly it towards the sun it's a pretty cool shot you know the 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 sun on the water that whole deal um and it got to a point where you kind of get some some math to do on the screen. You can see how fast it's flying, how much battery life you have left, how far away you are from home. That's race sort of against thing. time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I roll those dice. <laughs> left a, enough time for sure, um, according to the math, anyways. So stop recording. Turn turn the drone around. It's I don't know three thousand meters away, something like that. So I'm flying it back. And the meters per second did go down a little bit because it was kind of windy. But what I didn't realize was when you get below 10% battery on a drone, there is an emergency landing function that you cannot turn off as far as Into I know. Into the bay. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm, fucking, I'm flying my drone back and I'm look like st- still just looking at like meters per second, how much time is left. Cause it, it doesn't just give you a percentage. It gives you like your drone will shut off in three minutes or something like that so i'm flying this thing back and all of a sudden it says emergency landing and the only thing that you can do is dismiss the notice (laughs) you can tell it like oh i don't care that it's landing cool and it gives you 10 seconds that's it so it literally starts counting down and then it just (laughs) fucking drops itself straight into the ocean fuck and The amount of annoying questions my wife asked that seemed like, like first, like she might be listening. She knows. (laughs) She's definitely listening. Earmuffs, Maya. She knows that once I reach my rage point, I'm a fucking child. And there's just, there's no point in talking to me or asking me questions. You got to give me time. And she's like, is it waterproof? I'm like, yes. The flying fucking camera that's made out of plastic is completely waterproof. Like, can Fuck, we go get it? The, the amount of times <laughs> she asked me if it had, oh, well, it, maybe it just landed in the marsh. I was like, it's got a video camera on it. 
You like it's fucking it shows me where it is. And she just kept going and she was trying to make me feel better. And at one point I threw the controller into the bushes. <laughs> That's the walk of shame to go get something that you've thrown is the best. Because <laughs> you've like gotten over it and you're like, what Golf a fucking club, idiot. Please. Uh huh. For real. Oh um, my god, it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> I can relate so um, much to that. <laughs> I, br I broke play PlayStation controllers as a kid. I would get so oh, yeah. mad. Oh, I punched yeah. hole in the wall in my house parents house i had to rep more than once repair the drywall in my parents house for punching a hole like losing i thought like, you did a stand-up job too oh dude bang <laughs> no up way job. you could tell <laughs> no way bang you up tell job i was there it's just dense off the wall it was like a golf ball in my, <laughs> my bedroom wall <laughs> she also thinks that i'm going to be able to tell dji that it shouldn't have that function and that they'll send me a new one so i should keep my controller just in case <laughs> mr dji please i i went i went on their forums and this is definitely a thing and what sounded more frustrating are all the people that landed like a drone into the water right in front of themselves because it will uh, land even if no it's what 10 feet in front of you so like you're at a lake you're with your friends you're on a boat you're doing whatever if it hits that it will land itself so like a lot of these are I'm watching like a thousand dollars fly itself with four minutes of battery left into the water. And then it's fucking obviously cooked at that point. I mean, you could go get it and I don't know, put in a bag of rice. But uh, yeah, so luckily it was a Black Friday deal and I have the controller in case I can convince them that their emergency landing policy is bullshit. <laughs> I'm guessing it's there so that people don't just like. Are they're like flying them like over a bunch of people and it dies and it fucking free falls fucking, onto yeah, someone's man. head. I mean, it's it's honestly probably like an FAA thing. Um, yeah, but like dildos uh, flying aircraft the, or little the, the warnings and the math should not work the way yeah. that they do. I've never seen that before because I've had low battery <laughs> plenty of times and it's never been just like fuck off. I'm going into the ocean. Like sick. <laughs> It tell, it's got a certain the number, next day it's got a number to of times it. you can tell like, it to yes. fuck off. It's like, this yeah. is the last time you can't tell us uh -huh. to fuck off anymore. We're landing. Yeah. Fuck. That's yeah, brutal. Wait. So. It's that's my I just kick it over the throw the, the the remote into the bushes and have to go walk after it. <laughs> I wanted I her to leave shit, the porch. <laughs> I wanted her to leave the porch so go that outside. I could go get it. Yeah. <laughs> and she didn't. So I was like, yeah, I'll be right back. <laughs> Carter, go get the remote. I gotta go Walk. get that. Yeah, I'm gonna wake him up and have him crawl across the lawn. <laughs> oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> good times. Mm -hmm. Fuck. Oh. It was worth the entertainment, I suppose. <laughs> That's brutal. Yeah. I don't think I can top that. Although I had, I can't, actually, I know I can't top that, but I had a moment. So this is a, another like long or an old story is at the old location on Warren Avenue. One day Hunter and I were working out and then he decided he's going to take his clips off and throw it across the gym to the basket like we normally would. So awesome. fun, fucking Hunter underhands and throws it and goes over the whiteboard and then just magically hits the fire escape and pulls the alarm and they show up. And I guess I was thinking about that as I threw a clip across the gym the other day from one side of the gym towards the basket, which is in the general direction of our glass fridge. That's one of our members, like thankfully bought us a new one when our last one breaks. So I flip my, my clip across the gym. It bounces directly in front of the bucket up over the cubbies and directly into the glass hits the glass. And I hear a thump. I'm like, Oh no, I just broke the fridge. I don't know how I didn't break. Cause I fucking put some gas behind it. But all I could think about was that day you'd fucking through that clip and they showed up. <laughs> oh, it's ridiculous. it's not even doing it justice though. The so so obviously you have your like spring loaded clips mm. and there's like the it's L shaped legs. part of where you squeeze it. That hooked onto the fire alarm and pulled it down. Yeah, it wasn't the fire. It was escape. an amazing escape, fucking sure. throw. Oh, yeah, yeah, the alarm. It yeah, was, yeah. It was it was yeah. incredible. Because if it just hit it, it wouldn't have mattered. The clip I hooked had behind it and pulled it down. <laughs> it's fucking so good. <laughs> that was one of those those moments when they happen as a business owner, I think are important and almost like freeing. Because when you do that stuff and you're young, like especially back in the day, like like parents and coaches were, or teachers were so like authoritative and they're like, you're the biggest piece of shit who's ever lived. You're going to die. The FBI is coming. You're going to prison for a month. And like... <laughs> Hunter sets off the fire alarm, and when you're in charge, you just get to go, <laughs> that's amazing. Or you break something. It doesn't fucking ma matter in real life. So when yeah. you like have those things happen as an adult, and you're like, damn, 
I was so scarred from being a kid and being like, I broke that light or that like plant or some bullshit like that. And now it's like, fuck, I'll, I'll break it on purpose for fun. Just as an exercise. <laughs> Throw the remote in the bushes. Come on, Portland <laughs> FD. Come on down here. <laughs> Hunter, what you got? Uh, I don't have a whole lot of uh, personal life chat, but this weekend we get to see if uh, Rory McIlroy can get some, get some vengeance for his last uh last two tournaments here what's uh, this weekend the open championship and, uh, where's that i think they're i think it's in scotland it's in europe yeah that's at st andrews isn't it uh not this year it rotates i think they're at i think it's called royal troon one Sherm's year <laughs> and i think house. this is a golf stat that everyone <laughs> would be able to handle one year at st andrews rory had 18 two putts <laughs> Fuck. In a round. <laughs> Open Championship, UK. Yeah, it's in the UK. But now yeah, you're kind of guy, you're gonna sit on the couch and watch the whole doing. thing. Uh, or you come and go. Usually, well, it's pro- I'll, I'll watch. I'll watch the so final round this golf. weekend on Sunday. Is my problem with it? It's not, not even that. It's golf. It's it that depend- they're not yeah. even shooting. You're well, just, it they're depends just on it depends like, on the stream. The it depends on the the stream or what network's doing it. Because once it gets on like Sunday afternoon on CBS, you're fucked. It's like yeah, like yeah. you'll get to see everything. And that's but when you want to see it. Let's say if it. you th- throw ten yeah, bucks exactly. down on, on so somebody. You, know? you, I'll try. I try to watch like <laughs> catch it on thir- a little bit on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sherb, and then I'll like if I'm usually I have dinner with my mom on Sunday and which also happens to be like right when they're finishing up usually. So I don't usually get the ending, but this weekend with our competition, I'm going to have a Sunday to myself. So I'm going to fucking plant myself <laughs> in front of the play 18 holes nice and early and then plant myself in front of the TV for, uh, oh my God, that's the reverse the mighty roars. ducks. My grandfather's the kind of guy that half. records yeah. it. He records it and sits and watches every minute of it. It doesn't matter how long it Ooh, takes. I could record it and fast forward. I don't know if he fast forward. I would. That would but be like, one way to do it. Yeah. But he does yeah. that every every major tournament. He sits on his couch and he just watches it, start to finish. I think. I mean, there's a non-zero chance I would. If it were if it were like a real shitty day, holy fuck, that's the easiest thing. Alley That's an easy choice. <laughs> Alley oop for sure. <laughs> All right, nutrition, hydration, and body composition for the sport of CrossFit. Um, I think some of this podcast, although we've already addressed this sort of post misfit project, but we'll, we'll start a little bit with story time. So when I got started in CrossFit, um, it was very much around the timing of like, you would do the paleo challenges at your gym. You would do 30 days of paleo and potato, you piece of shit. Yeah. (laughs) And like, there would just be like, whatever, this person lost a certain amount of body fat or weight and you'd win the challenge like that sort of thing and and it's i think it's still a worthwhile thing to do every once in a while to see and we can talk about some of the reasons um on the podcast today but um for me it was powerful because that's how i was diagnosed with celiac disease while people were like crashing from not having as much sugar or you know processed foods i could like take a solid dump and I wasn't <laughs> losing a crazy amount of weight while eating a crazy amount of calories. Um, so that led me down a lot of rabbit holes into the community of the experts on things like paleo and keto and fasting and that whole world. And I'm like, honestly embarrassed because I'm, I'm a very curious person, but I'm also very skeptical. Like I'm always going to like sort of stress test ideas and devil's advocate and that sort of thing. But for some reason, a best selling book to me meant that there was science behind what the person was saying. Like I believed in a lot of stuff that I read there. Um, and, and the problem is there is so much sensationalism in those books and I kind of get why they're just trying to convince the American public that your shitty diet is going to kill you. And then if you eat this way, you're probably going to be healthier. But the way in which it was delivered and Sherb's joke about the white potatoes, um, 
Scumbag. sort of leans you leads you into this world of like <clears throat> so so many of those books did not have any amount of science behind them whatsoever work but for me work for everybody the, yeah the diet <laughs> work for a lot of people right like you're eating healthy unprocessed foods like that sort of thing probably improve blood markers um but it sort of set off this cascade for myself for a lot of people where it's like you can't eat carbs you shouldn't eat breakfast like all of these really sort of extreme ends of things so i wanted to put that out there just as like i don't know maybe a public service announcement of Johnny wrote a book and a lot of people bought it and that doesn't mean that anything in it is real whatsoever. You can write whatever the fuck you want in a book. Like this isn't being, you know, checked by somebody. This isn't a scientific journal, that sort of thing. Um, so part of that is the public service announcement. Part of it is like, are you going to be confused listening to this after listening to the Misfit Project? That's like, um, a, you must like listening to, to Lane Norton then. His fucking Instagram is great where he like, he'll post up someone's stupid studies like, the paleo chick says fucking this, that, and the other, and he's like, when he screams random, randomized, randomized control, control trials. trials. Yes. Yeah. If so only good. we had the randomized control. Oh, dude, he does that, and then he does. He just fucking goes on tangents, and he's got. Oh, he he, does. He's been dressing yeah. up the fucking the videos so good, but they're they're fairly entertaining. He's just basically like, why don't you go look at actual science, or at least look at what the data suggests, as opposed to just being like, I think this, so that therefore I'm going to write a book about it, or and make his, an Instagram account his information and i subscribe to he's got like a digital magazine that he does um the way that he presents information and there's one key element to it that was really helpful for me was the idea of mechanisms within the body and then what happens as a whole so like when you're taking uh you know biology classes and whatnot and they talk about a very specific thing that happens within a vacuum inside the body that's what someone like a say chris kresser would run with and be like this is how this happens in the body but when you zoom out and you look at the entire situation the whole body the you know all of these different factors things don't play out in that way um so it's more of a, a micro view versus a macro view and he talks about how when he was in school like the mechanisms were everything he was like, you can't do this. You have to do this. This works. This doesn't work. That sort of thing. And his professor was like, then explain the research. Like, why, if this is black and white and 100% true, does it not show up when we research actual human beings? That sort of thing. So I think that was important for me. That was one of the tipping points for me to be like, okay, like, I think I need to start questioning these things and, and look at it from a different perspective. I think yeah, I something else to... Go ahead, Anna. <clears throat> something else to consider and i was i think lane was on i think it was chris williamson's podcast yeah, he's fairly recently yeah. um and this is this is something that i i kind of like have discovered or just like realized more as i learn more about this but like the another huge issue with like studies like general blanket term especially um I'll just yeah the the a huge issue with studies is is, is that it relies generally on self reporting so it relies on the human beings who have already decided to take part in the study to accurately and truthfully you know report what they're doing and we also we also know that like this is a huge issue because the the age old like saturated fat causes heart disease argument and it's like that they're like there you could find a study that says that but what you're not accounting for is what the fuck else all of those those people are eating like in in like you know it's not they're not just eating saturated fat it's the saturated fat comes from the cheeseburger the french fries the excessive you know consumption of carbs and and fat together and probably a lack of protein and it's like you could make a study say anything you know, if you have the right people doing the wrong things. Um, and I think it's just important that people like when they are reading content or studies or whatever, that they are taking it with a, you know, with a metaphorical grain of salt, because there's like at the end of the day, studies are composed of human beings in, you know, conducting their doing their make behaving like human beings. And there's a natural kind of fault in that. And when you try to apply 
you know, the results of a study to your own personal nutrition, like, again, you have to just kind of be a little bit skeptical and take that with a grain of salt. And ultimately, um, I, you know, I think we'll probably get to it eventually, but you, you really have to figure out what works well for you because somebody who works well with the intermittent fasting stuff, uh, another person really doesn't, you know, that doesn't work well for someone who works super well on a high carb diet, you know, is not the same person who, you know, works well with minimal carbohydrates. So what, um, what you recognize too, is like, you know, working at the affiliate with athletes is that, you know, one of the easiest ways we can start to help somebody. It's like, show me what you eat. And if they don't send you a picture of it every single time you eat, you have to realize that it's probably not as accurate as they think it is. And that's the difficulty with a lot of these conversations. Like we just start with what your baseline is and make sure what your baseline is. We have a good grasp on what that is. Otherwise the information I'm going to give you isn't as helpful as it could be. And in my experience, most people say, oh yeah, eat healthy. And then when you start getting the photos, you're like, mm, that's okay, but this could be better. Or yeah, that, that's not really going to do or it for you. Or you look at someone's food log and you're like, I don't calories. believe that this is what you're eating. <laughs> And that's what you look like. Like this, there's something that doesn't line up here. No, I definitely agree there. And that's where it's, it's a hard conversation. It's like, you know, I'm, and I heard you say this quite a few times at the, you know, just talking, I think both on these podcasts and like, I've heard you say at the whiteboard, but like a lot of the places you go that are, aren't a CrossFit gym are going to sugarcoat things and not tell you honestly, but like, there's no one better qualified. When, like, no, it was, this is your opinion. I, I believe I'm echoing. So yeah. if I'm wrong. Tell me yeah, if I'm no, wrong here, but, but like, um, there's no one more qualified than your CrossFit coach to tell you, Hey, like it's blatantly obvious to me that what you're doing isn't working or, or you've been coming to the gym for so long and you're struggling with your results and you want to know why that is. I have the answer. The hard work for you is going to be adhering to it. And that's fixing this diet because you know, you can outside of working on pull-ups, the only thing that's going to get you pull-ups is working on your diet. Yeah. So we're going to actually going to start at the end, um, in a way to, to put out there what certain things could be that someone could use as like a metric. Um, and this one, the, the first one's interesting because there's a, there's an amount of lean body mass, um, that high level CrossFit games athletes have. Um, and it's, it's pretty close for most of them, which, which I think is interesting. What most people's minds go to though, is like a super low body fat percentage. Um, and one way to think about that would be if the, if the average CrossFit Games male has 185 pounds of lean body mass, the shredded dude that weighs 180, does he have 185 pounds of lean body mass? <laughs> he, he doesn't even weigh 185 Zero pounds. Zero percent like, body yeah, fat. Yeah, even if he's 10% body fat, he's got about 160. So you're looking at 25 pounds of muscle that he's down um, from that, matters. that person. <laughs> um, that matters a little bit, right? And there's, I think there's a reason I, ha I had this discussion with a with a you know top ten games athlete recently. But it's like, why are we trending towards the bigger athlete kind of making that comeback? Um, and you know, there there are a lot of dudes now that are in that two ten to two twenty range at the games. Like you think about that list of people, like there's like six or seven people that I think could truly come in second through fourth kind of a thing. They're, they're almost all of them are big, like real big, um, real thick. Like, and especially there's, there's some of the athletes where you just don't understand how their torso is the size that it is. It's like a, <laughs> it's like a Husafel stone. You're just like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> like, how is it possible for their torso to be that big? Um, and it's also why someone as short as Matt Fraser had to weigh as much as he did, right? Yeah, he's like beefy. he's talked about he's talked about being up in the range of like 205 to 210, I believe, um, when he's going in to compete. And that gives you the opportunity when you are at those weights at the the 205, the 210, that sort of thing, um, to carry an amount of body fat that doesn't have us in the stands our, our joke that we always have with the athletes is that they need a sandwich 
or sometimes you look that hungry. Guy needs two sandwiches <laughs> you, you or there was one guy at Granite Games one year that needed three sandwiches. He's he broke the record. Um, <laughs> but again, this is this is an athlete that I think weighed about 175 pounds and was probably 7% body fat. That kind of thing. And it just wasn't going to happen. Like like they had the motor, they had the skill set. People wanted to know year after year why they weren't making it and they were at a full three sandwich deficit. Um, and that's why they weren't able to do that. What we think about oh, next and actually sandwiches. right yeah. um yeah, on the women's go. side <laughs> according to someone that i don't know what their credibility is so i won't call them out the women's side it's about 125 pounds of lean body mass um women at the crossfit games carry a higher um body fat percentage than males do um and in a lot of instances perform better <laughs> So I'll just kind of throw that out there. There are there are events where you can truly make one to one comparisons between men and women. And there are some women that can hang, which is yeah, would you say would you say the men's was 180 or 185 pounds of lean body mass? Yeah. yeah so, so basically you would go in and be pounds. like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're looking at like we know what that probably to percentage wise, like body fat percentage. No, that's not about 90 as- in the yeah, neighborhood 10%. of 90 yeah 10% somewhere fat. in that range and i think it fluctuates from athlete to athlete um but you're looking at basically we're we're talking about like the amount of you know body fat percentage it would be the inverse of that um so you would subtract that from from 100 percent. the other thing that's super important here is that idea of strength to body weight ratio which comes up a lot and i think is probably a little bit more um, makes a little bit more sense to think about for a lot of our listeners. We get athletes who apply for remote coaching, who have some pretty lofty goals, who probably live in the neighborhood of 20 to 25% body fat. So you're looking at that lean body mass taking a significant blow or the person weighing just too much for that strength to body weight ratio to be worth it, Right. Like we all know what it's like to put on that extra weight in the back squat feels the way that it does and the dip in the muscle up feels the way that it does. Right. So there is, um, some correlation here between this idea and there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that goes into how you would manipulate these numbers. We're going to talk about the nutrition, but like, let's say you are at a one to three sandwich deficit, very scientific scale. Um, I'm a three sandwich how much guy. do you how, how much you need to eat or how much you need to dial back conditioning for hypertrophy right like a lot of the strength schedules the the things that we do um benefit you on a neurological level like a lot of your your single double triple things of that nature that's the beginner gains that neurological level that's where you can get stronger faster if you want to get strong if you want to be a strong person if you want to be known in that way that's why we program so much fucking accessory work to be able to go in and have the hypertrophy and have the six sets of 10 and have the, all this extra work you've got to do, you know, what's the prescription between five and 30 reps. It's like six sets a week per muscle group. There's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, so if you're doing that and you're doing two or three conditioning pieces a day, how much longer is that runway for you to be able to accomplish this goal of getting to a lean body mass that's anywhere near 185 pounds, which is a huge part of what it takes to get there. Obviously, VO2 max is a is a whole nother thing. Um, that's that's important to be there, but there's definitely something about that world of like you go to semifinals and you see these athletes just absolutely you know crush all of the conditioning pieces but the writing's on the wall you can see it like you could see it in the athletes that even did well in event one this year at semifinals but like they were near failure on those clean and jerks towards the end of the time and it's like yeah you took fifth or sixth on this event but those lunges the snatches the 225 like front squats <laughs> it's just not going to happen it's very yeah. binary when it comes to those strength numbers um you guys want to jump in on any of that before we get into the prescriptions? I mean, I look at that as a, as a conversation for, you know, it's, it's difficult at first to have that with a remote athlete, but it's definitely something that has to happen if they have specific goals is you have to help them kind of understand 
I think Hunter likes to use the word wickets, but that kind of the front high end and low end of where you can be in this sport to be able to be competitive. And that, you know, I've worked with an athlete for a few years and that's one of the conversation pieces that we have is, you know, they've made a lot of progress towards improving the amount of mass they have on their bones, but it's like, and I want you just to go, do me a favor, go look at any athlete you idolize or just honestly pull up the top, all the Cross the Games athletes from last year and go profile by profile by profile and assume that their profiles are reasonably accurate and just look at the sizes. Like look what they weigh. You know, look at their heights, look at their weights, and you could probably very quickly, and we did this, I mean, I know you did this years ago, Drew, but you looked at the the composite average of height and weight for all CrossFit Games athletes for male. And it was the champions. Like, <laughs> yeah, and it was, I don't know, like 2015, but guess what, whose it was? It was Rich's Fro- yeah. Rich Froning's exact dimensions. Like, yeah, that, it was weird. There, there's a very specific thing. There's a reason why, you know, the, fuck, what's that giant dude from Underdog's name, the Matt, uh, fuck. He's like 17 feet tall, and he had the pull-up bar adjusted at Granite Games. But anyways, the Lugos. Uh, yeah, yeah. So he's like 48 feet tall. There's a, you know, sorry, like he's not going to get away with being 265 to be the, the body mass he needs <laughs> for this height. He's just, he's just not built anatomically to be a, you know, CrossFit Games champion. Is he still a very high level competitor? Absolutely. Will he waste your ass on rowing? Sure. But there's things he's going to trade off. So it's just realizing like, you know, you need to be within certain wickets and then realize that like you are always going to have some sort of trade off. CrossFit has hopefully taught you that you are a generalist and you're never going to be very good at one single thing without expending some energy or losing something from something else. You know, I like to use like the video game slider. Like imagine you're a video game character and if you're like me, you played Madden and you want everyone's stats at 100, but like that's not how it works in CrossFit. If I up the strength all the way to 100, I'm probably going to lose a little bit in the speed or I'm going to lose a little bit in the accuracy or one of the components of fitness. And you have to realize that like you need to be within these certain wickets, but you then have to figure out what is the best... configuration of these sliders that helps you reach your goals and for some athletes it's you know pouring all the time into being like all right my sessions are lifting an accessory and then my third piece is going home and eating 16 pounds of rice that's my that's my training day and other athletes it's like hey put the fucking fork down buddy and go put your running shoes on and do some laps (laughs) that's what you need to do to get better at the sport and so like it's realizing like you know not everyone's it's not a one size fits all fix for everybody but you, if you can't have that honest conversation with yourself and if you can't understand kind of the brackets you need to be in to be competitive, like you can still be really fit, but that might be the reason why you can't push through to that next threshold. That's the reason why you aren't making that leap is that, you know, you, you're having a tough time really, really having the honest conversation with yourself and doing what has to be done to get you to the place you want to be. It's true. And I think that's probably what things like that and there's there's the mental side as well there's there's dealing with you know someone might have gone through something you know really um troubling and touchy in their life that you have to address as a remote coach and it it to me good remote coach great remote coach you have to be able to have these conversations the idea that you are telling an athlete that you're all in on getting them to their goals and you're unwilling to say to them at your current size it's not possible and that's too small and too big right like if you're not doing that if you're not willing to do that um and then that would just be a nod to that's a psa for remote clients like sometimes someone caring about your goals when they are you know sort of in the trust tree when they deliver that information you got to be okay with it yeah you're putting yourself out there with i want to be a semifinals athlete and it's like you know, hey, you, you, you weigh 230, like that's probably not going to happen. Something I've always appreciated having, you know, worked with clients who are not of uh, American descent is that they, they'll tell you straight up exactly what they're thinking. And they look at that as being the nicest person possible because they're being honest. They're not sugarcoating and telling you a bunch of bullshit. You it's want that nice and kind spectrum. Yeah, like, hey, listen, I'm trying to tell you exactly what you need to hear. I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings. I don't, I'm not attaching feelings to this. I'm just telling you exactly right. what I think. And I'm sorry you feel that way. And if you can take the advice for what it is, which is actual help, not, hey, you're a shithead. Like I say this to athletes and all the time. If I scale you in class, it's not because I don't believe in you. It's because I want you to get a good workout. And I want you to realize that I want what's best for you. I would never scale you to give you a suboptimal training session. I want you to have the best experience every time you're here. So you want to come back. You just have to realize that my runway and your runway might be at the same velocity. Like I have to get you there. What I think is the right dose. 
Like yesterday's workout's a great example. Scale a bunch of people to barbell push press instead of handstand push ups because they don't have handstand push ups in a good enough capacity. And I said to him, like, listen, I know you can put 115 over your head a handful of times. Can you do it 50 times with power cleans in less than eight minutes? He was like, yeah. And I'm like, no, you can't. Sorry. Like, this is the weight for you. It's 95. It's 85. It's 75. And at the end of the workout, it's like, oh, I get it. It's like, I know. I've seen this movie. I know how it's going to go. I've done this enough times to know what's the right dose for you. So please take the advice. And it's funny because we have someone new that came in and was like, I want to do handstand push-ups. And he's setting up, a, you know, the two plates and the ab mat in the middle. And I'm like, so you're telling me you're going to do strict deficit handstand push-ups in this workout? He's like, yep. I'm Easy. Like, no. He's like, I can do it. It's only two reps. I'm like, it's 20, it's 18 reps. So I told him like, you know, pick two reps after every single set. Pick a, a number you can repeat. And lo and behold, who was last? No. Me? Kidding I've me? Seen, I've seen it. <laughs> so, All yeah, right. It's one of those lessons. Yeah, for sure. Tool number one, non-negotiable, um, touchy subject for a lot of people. I don't think in the competitive space at all. I don't think anyone believes that this isn't the case. Calories in, calories out. As a CrossFit competitor, you need to know whether you are trying to maintain body weight, lose body weight, or gain body weight. And you need to know what calorie amount makes that happen for the current volume that you're doing. That is the baseline for this entire conversation. We could get a lot of the other things right here and under fueled or I'm trying to lose weight and I'm in a surplus. All of these things will be completely out of whack. I think the argument is one of semantics. Calories in, calories out is real. Calories in, calories out is how you gain or lose body weight. It is such a fucking complex measurement that when someone reduces it down to those words, I think it's triggering for other people. But people make up the craziest science. My body's in starvation mode. <laughs> it's like, if your body is is burning less calories because it thinks you're not going to feed it, that's still calories in, calories out. And you can just head out the fucking door and take a walk. Stomach and churning starvation, muscles burning. Starvation mode is solved. You know what I mean? So like, there's a lot of weird shit here. And again, basal metabolic rate for different people, fidgety people, people that take more steps, people that exercise, people that higher exercise intensity, all of that. It does come into play, but it is still an equation. So that's step number one is figuring that out. Um, there are a lot of calorie calculators online um, there are a lot of different ways to figure this out. There's a pretty good chance that if you're a competitive CrossFitter, that whatever number is spit out from one of those things is going to be a little bit low. Um, you just got to assume, assume, like, gonna... you you assume what the average person's fucking that calculator is based on like Susie works at an office. She takes 15 steps a day. She doesn't exercise. This is how many calories she should eat. Sure. Yeah, but again, context for today, for at least right now in this conversation, is for a CrossFit competitor. Yeah, and I, I think like at the end of the day, for for most CrossFit competitors or you know aspiring whatever, you're they're probably not fluctuating in weight massively over the course of like a couple of weeks or a month or something. And I think ultimately the the in order to simplify this the most is to just you need to start recording your food. Like, oh, download an app, download a free app and just record everything that you eat. And if you know, like, hey, like I, I basically hold on to th like, this is my body weight. This is about where I kind of sit generally, plus or minus a few pounds, depending on, you know, heat, water, like just very fundamental basics. But otherwise, like just recording what you eat and being like, OK, I eat on average 2600 calories a day and that's where you know i sit at 178 pounds and that's about where i sit so that can at least be my starting point and you know you can use a calorie calculator or something like that to help a little bit and like drew said that's not going to be perfectly accurate it's more of just a starting point but i would i would say like the 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 best starting point is that you need to know what you are eating and what that looks like from a caloric and macronutrient perspective before you start to make any crazy adjustments because and i don't remember if we were talking about this while we were actually rolling or not but it has to be fucking honest like the number of times <laughs> that you i will like look at somebody and they're like and they tell me it's probably just a conversation so you know about four and a half percent of it's accurate it's like 
listen, like, I don't need to have a much longer of a conversation to know the words that are coming out of your mouth are about as reliable as the food that's going into your mouth. You uh, need that Maury Povich, like the lie detector to determine that was a lie. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't matter. We're not, not trying to no gaslight but anybody honest. to record your food, record it honestly. And if it's not like it has to be on, I, it blows my mind that people will do that dishonestly. And again, probably has to do with some, you know, uh, deeper non-nutrition related things, but like, that it has to that has to be it if you if you're going to start to improve your nutrition but you're starting from the wrong place then it's like the that's the matter. biggest thing that has helped me be honest with that and it's not really about honesty or dishonesty it's like do i really want to measure the oil that i'm like putting in the pan or whatever what's helped sure. me with that is the concept that it's fuel and not like shameful gluttony like i am putting this into my body fat for my hormones, protein for my muscles, glucose for energy so that I can work and go exercise. When you start to think about it as like, I'm going to, even if you're an affiliate member all the way up to a CrossFit Games athlete, I am going to go do this thing. And the best way to do it is to fine tune my nutrition and my hydration and my recovery and all those things. If you can make that switch, like it just makes sense to, to go in and, and be honest with those numbers because you're like, this is the fuel that I'm putting in my body to accomplish what I'm trying to do. So step number one, calories in, calories out. Find out with your current volume what would be your maintenance calories, what makes you hover you know in that you know two to four pound range of where you're at. Um, and then basically you can just start to add, you know, add 250 calories, subtract 250 calories, somewhere in that range when you are trying to gain or lose weight. Um, next, we'll talk about macronutrients. Um, man, there's a movement right now for the like visual macros. And, and I think after a period of time, it might be a good idea for people who have a tough relationship with both the scale and the food scale, but it's basically just the idea of like, is it, is your, is the protein on your plate, the size of your fist and is, you know, that sort of thing. So visually I know that I need 200 grams of carbs per meal or some, something crazy in games prep. What does that look like so that you're not always, you know, sort of stuck on that. Um, but I think, if you are trying to be competitive in the sport, you need to weigh and measure for enough time to really dial in where you're at. Um, the protein number is an interesting one. Um, there is no science to support. I believe it's something odd. Like there's no science to support more than 77% of your body weight in pounds um, per gram. So like we say one pound per gram. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you eat 200 grams. There's no real science to support above 77% of that number. When you are taking in quality protein sources, they find that up to 82% is valid when it is mixed sources. Um, and then they do find that there's a bit of a, when you do get up into the one gram per pound, there's more of a thermogenic effect. Your body takes more energy to burn the protein. So it's possible to up your protein in certain instances to lose weight. Um, you, you know, feel a little bit more full, so you're less likely to tack on more food and you do actually burn more calories doing it. But from a muscle protein synthesis standpoint, if you were to get, 0.77 grams per pound of body weight in like meat, fish, whey protein powder, you're good to go. Um, and I think that that can be important because what that does is for someone in like games prep, you can lean into the idea of this is the amount of calories that I need and I can probably get a few more grams of carbs in when it comes to that. Um, so I have noticed that it is a little bit easier for me to lose weight at a gram per pound, but there isn't really any science to support um, going above those numbers. So I like to start with the protein number because that one to me is kind of as simple as it gets. Somewhere between 75 and 100% in that number of grams per pound. It all depends your, on the athlete. Of, of the goal body weight, Drew, or of their current? 
in this in when we're talking about for competition we're talking about their current body weight current, because yeah. it is this is what we are this is the musculature that we're so assuming we're fueling. not trying to gain or lose body mass body weight sure sure yeah. yeah yeah and especially as you get into the moments where if you're in a semifinals prep phase or a games prep phase um is very much about fueling for performance typically you would want to do your you know your cut or your gain at a different time of the year um but again you you as you let's say you are gaining a pound a week or something like that like that that's what you're trying to put on you would adjust those numbers as you go um to help you fat and and the funny thing is you kind of either have to be good at math or ask someone that's good at math to help you because we go from um like one gram per pound is the thing here. And then we talk about percentage of total calories from fat. So that's an equation. And then when you're backfilling with carbs, you again have to be like, okay, how many calories do I have left now? Divide that by four to get your grams, that sort of thing. Um, fat, we're typically going to ask an athlete to be between 20 and 30% of their total calories for performance from fat. Um, and that's something that you can play around with. Some people, um, do better, you know, in that 30 to 35% range, they digest it pretty well. It probably has a lot to do with the sources that they're using or, or that they're consuming. Um, and then as you get closer and closer to an event, that's when you would, as that athlete end up being at 30%, 25%, 20% so that you can make sure that while you're training, you actually are topping off those off those glycogen stores. Um, that's super important there. So we have our calories, which set like, okay, we're subtracting from this. We would subtract out that protein. We would subtract out that fat. And then now we are left with a calorie amount that should be carbohydrate, right? Like if you have whatever, 1500 or We'll go 1600 is easier. If you have 1600 <laughs> calories left, you divide by four, that's 400 grams of carbohydrate. Um, and what's interesting about this is you'll see some athletes with these crazy carb numbers, but when you look at it's it's basically just because their calorie number's high and they've done something similar to what we're talking about here, and that's what's left, right? They have to consume this much to to maintain that body weight and a lot of athletes do really well you know crossfit games athletes do well between 500 and 700 grams i say of carbs, i always laugh the they, they show brent fakowski's macros Fikowski, in the crossfit yeah. games it's like <laughs> 900, grams, 900 grams, of grams of carbs every day for the seven days bless of the his heart games. too you see him downing food in the back that's you just, so sad so many athletes couldn't stomach but he's trained himself to do it and he's taken a non crossfit crossfit size body and podiumed and been in the top 10 however many fucking times so like, like that he's honestly bringing him up as a really good example of why this needs to be such a large part of the conversation and i don't think always is because it's got emotion attached to it and it's taboo I had a conversation recently with a remote client that was like had some really good ideas of how we were going to move the needle but admitted that they only counted their calories uh, in April leading into semifinals. And it's like, what if we did, I think it would move the needle more to do 12 months of that leading into the next one to know like, if you felt that good during semis prep and at semifinals, what would it do to your results to fuel properly and be fitter every single day the entire year? And of course, we're always, every time we reset the clock as remote coaches, it's like, what is the what is the thing or the things that we can do as a change to make an athlete better? And if we're not tackling this portion of the conversation, like so many of those other things can fall by the wayside. An underfueled athlete asking them to like up their volume or something. Stupid. They're going to fucking quit in November. Yeah, it's just not going to work. <laughs> uh, Drew, curious why you went in a different order i know historically we mm -hmm. suggest like backfilling with fat so now yeah, you so have a, now you now you're fixing the number of carbohydrates rather than recommending a number of carbs and then getting cows from fat 
Just curious. Sure. Yeah. I think, again, it's because we're going to get that fluctuation with a performance athlete of like, wow, we've got this volume going up. And if we have that volume going up, there's an implication of how much glucose they're getting rid of. Um, so it's like, okay, we have our, we have our protein fixed and we're gonna hopefully over the course of a year, figure out, is it 20% fat, 25%, 30% fat? Like, where does that athlete live within that? But then like, as their volume goes up, that implication again of the carbohydrate being the source that they need and the thing that's going to fuel what they're doing um, is I think more important once you have that fat situation dialed in in terms of like hormone levels. Because you're, you're, if you if you let's say you were fixed at 25% of your calories from fat and you know that that worked well for you, they'll it will go up as your calorie needs change, like as you start to perform there. But there's no implication of I need more and more and more and more fat because I'm training more. So that's how I think about it from a performance standpoint. That fuel that we're asking for is from the carbohydrate. So so we're saying the protein and carb and fat are fixed, but we might consume more calories. I guess just during a higher training, higher volume of training and the additional Correct. calories are going to come from carbs. Yeah. And and one other way to look at it that could sort of sound like devil's advocate is I think it's more important to dial in your fat to find out at what point like like I know sure you you get into the 30 to 35% and you have GI distress from it typically. Um, I like eating so, that way. Just can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it makes food taste better. You take sure chicken and rice, does. and you dump a couple of tablespoons of olive oil on it, and by Damn, God, it's good. <laughs> it's way better than it was before no. you did that. Yeah. Um. So I think you know if an athlete's like trying to win the games and they're doing blood work, that's when you could really dial in. You know where you would want your your percentage of of fat to be. But I. It seems to be really personalized, athlete to athlete. So finding that window, and again, if I'm eating 3,000 calories and then I go into games prep and I'm eating 3,500, 30% 30, 30 of 3,500 is higher than 30% of, of 3,000. So um, something, to, something to think about there. I, how do I word this without basically erasing the beginning of the conversation? I think athletes, okay, so you guys are, sure. how many calories a day do you think you would eat if you did not exercise <clears throat> to maintain body weight? 2,700 to 3,000, somewhere in that range. If you didn't exercise? Yeah, o only because like, I have a job that's pretty active. I mean, I walk about 50 miles he a week working. He weighs 40 pounds more than you. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> See that shit? I would be like, I mean, I'd be like 2,400, I think, 2,300, 2,400, somewhere yeah, I in was that gonna, range. I was going to say I'd probably be closer <clears throat> to 2,000. My personal rule for myself, there's, there's a bunch of reasons for this. I think what your body needs to maintain body weight in a sedentary lifestyle is the baseline of whole unprocessed or at least low ingredient foods. I think it's really doable to eat a diet of, you know, meat, vegetables, you know, you got your rice, potatoes, oats, things like that can all be in there. I mean, I ate a bunch of rice pasta. It literally just says rice on the fucking ingredients. So I don't care that they grind it up and shape it into a noodle. Like I don't, I don't fucking care. <laughs> that doesn't bother me. Um, I know it's, I know it's not paleo. I'm very sorry, but Unbelievable. I think, I think starting there. So that, cause I think the excuse is like, so-and-so eats Snickers and 19 scoops of Gatorade powder. And it's like, that person eats 4,000, 5,000 calories a day. It's, try doing that with Whole Foods. <clears throat> it's real fucking hard. But like, yeah, I, think I really the... think that somewhere around that baseline and, and you see someone like a, like a Fikowski actually do better than that. Like you see that dude pound real food, like a lot of it. It's kind of absurd to watch. And not everybody's going to be able to do that. Not everybody's going to have the discipline at that level. But I think that's a really good place to start. Um, and it will lead us in a little bit into the hydration conversation because like those foods all have water in them. 
<laughs> like there's a lot of water within that. And it's like the, the processed food diet, you have to go up to like something like 75% of your body weight in pounds per day to be hydrated if you're only eating processed foods like well a lot of it foods. i think a lot of it is that you get like probably not going to get too deep into the micronutrient conversation and it's like it is i would say let on the there is there's a hierarchy i would say it's less important but it's not not important right and when we're eating it's almost an order of operations versus not being important right like if you yeah. don't do the other things, like if you if you take a bunch of multivitamins and don't eat, you'll fucking die. Like, <laughs> like that's not gonna help yeah, you. Not, yeah, but it is, it, is like, it really is incredibly important. Like we did the Misfit Project episode where we listed off what each micronutrient does in your body, and it's like, yeah, you might want to eat food or supplement with the right things. Yeah, for sure. And there's, I think, just yeah, the the whole unprocessed food is is the place to start for everybody. Like regardless of of goal whether it's crossfit games or crossfit affiliate athlete and yeah i think the the micronutrient element is just the most overlooked probably because it's the least people understand it the least and i'm certainly no expert in it but there are just so many valuable things that micronutrients do for performance it's why we have things like sodium and magnesium in proper you know in the hydrate and stuff like that to create to allow for stronger muscle contractions like there are there are a whole host of reasons that we want to ensure that micronutrients are in play. You get those from your whole, your unprocessed foods, your organic grass fed. You know, we would advocate for buying the highest quality of food that you can reasonably afford. Right. And you could say it's like you either pay for it now or you pay for it later for a competitive athlete. Maybe that's a little bit less of a concern, but there is still a lot of benefit to having you know, the highest quality of food because it is generally much more rich in the micronutrients that are needed for processes that you might not, you probably wouldn't notice if we didn't talk about them, but is still going to move the needle from a performance perspective. And that's where my mind goes and where that rule came from in my head was like my body has a certain level of needs when it comes to micronutrients. There's like a baseline of what I'm trying to accomplish. And then if I go out there and I manipulate my calories in calories out with a ton of exercise, it's a pretty good chance that I need fucking water, salt, carbs, like that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's a really good place to start. And then if you wanted to take it further, it would be with the blood testing. There's just going to be a ton of genetic mutations that are going to mess with the absorption of certain things. You're going to have taste preferences. You're not going to want to eat certain foods, especially during periods of training. Um, but I think if you started there and tried to work up um, and got yourself to a place where the majority of your food was from that, then you wouldn't have to worry about it as much. The reason why I think it's not simple. It's not a simple conversation. It's not easy to measure. There are cooking methods that enhance the micronutrient content. There are people that eat a shitload of vegetables that have no micronutrient content in them whatsoever. They're fucking, you know, eating like a cow, you know, just sitting there chomping on broccoli that they've maybe like steamed and dumped the water out and there's no, there's nothing left in it. It's fucking gone. It's like, well, that that's brutal, especially to somebody like me. Fuck. Oof. No thanks. <laughs> yeah, and I mean yeah, not no to thanks. mention not to mention things like your you know your gut health and how well your body digests and absorbs the nutri the the actual like macronutrients. Like if it were if they weren't important, then we would see athletes drinking protein powder, maltodextrin, and drinking olive oil. You know, it's like there's your carbs, protein, and fat. <laughs> like why aren't why aren't Bro, we doing book. that? And, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Let's write a book right now. Oh, do that that. and then only do monostructural conditioning gymnastics on its own and weightlifting on its own i will the i'm gonna Imagine publish the shits it you with have, no bro. studies i'm gonna have the new york <laughs> times bestseller oh my god drink olive oil i die that's not that I've, bad. I, I did it on the zone diet i'd never leave months. the toilet i'd be glued to it i'd have to take all of the podcasts in the, on the toilet Bulletproof Sherb, you guys didn't know, but back then he was recording from the bathroom the whole time. <laughs> Dude, I also did Bulletproof and I was a moron at first. I just put pats of butter in my coffee. I wouldn't even blend it. Just fucking oh. sip around it. So you were literally just, it's not a multiplied at all. You're just drinking <laughs> no, butter. Just drinking butter on top of coffee. Oh, damn. My Those time hop had it. I was like, oh my God. That's, what the fuck is wrong with me? It's healthy. It's healthy. 
Those were the Thanks, days. Dave. Fuck. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> so yeah, um, we need a certain amount of lean body mass, a pretty high amount of lean body mass to excel in the sport relative to the people that you're competing at at the level that you're competing. Um, no surprise, it goes up and up and up. You find your few outliers in your gym that don't look the way you think they would when they perform the way that they do. Um, and there are way less of them at semifinals. A couple of people you see out there and you're like, whoa, how'd they do it? Um, and then you get to the CrossFit games and they're either from a far reaching place in the world that gets a special, special invite to the CrossFit games or they're not there at all. Um, so we think about that. Um, when we bring it back to most of the audience that we're talking to, um, a good look in the mirror of what you want to accomplish and then the 360 and stare you're the only person that's going to be able to control that back in the face and say do i need to gain weight and what does that mean how many calories do i need to eat and do i need to back off of my conditioning that sort of thing or in a lot of instances can i be at the 20 to 30 percent body weight or the 20 to 30 percent body fat percentage and find my way to the place that i want to go and the answer is going to be no like we are going to have to make some serious changes for you to hit your goals. Good thing is these are things that you can manipulate with a little bit of math and, you know, some like putting your head down and getting to work. It's really all just about how bad do you want that versus leaning into your old behaviors. Yeah. I mean, one thing we didn't, haven't really talked about and it's kind of understandable because there's not much to talk about is just the genetic component is, is not to be yeah, ignored and, that's in and the, significant. That's in the calories in, calories out equation, right? Like some people yeah, are born sure. and their metabolic rate is through the fucking roof and they have to, you know, people have seen Austin eat before. <laughs> and I mean, those fucking well, English steers. You know, someone like Cody is always a, a good example of someone who can perform at like a super high level without a whole lot of carbohydrate. And it's like, like, I don't know what to tell you what to tell you about that but i think the 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 big picture kind of lesson there is just like you have to know where what you're doing right now and whether or not like you know you make an assessment of whether you're trying to increase or decrease your body weight and then it's just it's experimentation it's it's what works what works for you what gives you the energy that you need at the times that you need it and you know it it's such it's such a cop out thing about how personalized it is, but it really is a a personal experiment that you have to kind of run on yourself uh, until you find the right you know you've got the levers in the right spot. Um, there are apps now where you track your calories and it just uses an algorithm to basically be like if you weigh this much and are consuming this many calories, tell us do you want to maintain do you want to lose a pound a week do you want to gain a pound a week and it'll just change your calorie numbers that sort of mm. thing so those yeah. those things do Not exist surprising. they are out there and also if again if you like math google sheets will also do that for you It'd be pretty straightforward on like i ate this many calories you know you can measure your exercise any way you want and this is what i weigh that sort of thing all right uh let's talk about hydration this is talked about even less way less than the nutrition side. Um, and some of the like graphs about like what happens to your body. Um, like one of the things that we've talked about for with the zone two work is this idea of cardiac drift and, and the right athlete or the athlete that's, you know, metabolically functioning in the way that they should, you know, highly aerobic should be able to go hold whatever 150 watts on a machine if that's in their you know if that's in their zone two and not have their heart rate heart rate fluctuate much over the course of an hour but if you lose six pounds of water weight within an hour which some athletes do um especially if it's super humid that sort of thing um then you get your you will be down to uh 75% of your capacity at that point so we're not always just talking about in a vacuum, this is your aerobic capacity and you need to be able to do this. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what it would take, what sort of like, cause I don't find like on the Garmin, you can tell it how much water you're drinking, but it's very much like open the app and find the thing and 
click the little thing to have the ounces go up throughout the day. Um, I don't know what the solution is for it to become as popular as like macro counting, but I think that's missing from the community. You really just, I don't know how many people out there really measure how much they're drinking every single day. And if you're a CrossFit, if you're a quarterfinal, semifinals, CrossFit games athlete with aspirations to be better than you were, that's another thing that you should be measuring every single day. Oh, your um, metabolic processes go through hydration. If your cells aren't adequately hydrated, you can't do the things your body is trying to do, which you know, for a lot of your CrossFit athletes is perform at a high level and then recover at a high level. If you don't have enough hydration, you can't do either of those things well. And why do all the work if you're not going to get all the returns on your investment? That's the way, easiest way I describe it to athletes at the affiliates. Like, you work really, really hard. Do you, do you want to be able to give 100% when you're here? Or do you want to give 100% and get 100% back? Or do you want to give 100% and get 40% back? Like, obviously those numbers can be fudged a bit. But the idea here is you want all of your investment of time and energy to be come back to you with results. It's also a literal lubricant for your body, like but joints and Literally, joints yeah. and, 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 and muscle tissue, you know, and, and it's like an athlete, athlete who comes into the gym just in like on a day like today where it's 90 degrees and super high humidity and you talk to them about the hydration and it's like I'm sore and I'm tight from the day before. And I'm coming in, I clearly didn't hydrate after that workout and I'm dehydrated going into this workout. It's like, that's the recipe for injury too. It's like you get tissues that aren't sliding in the manner that they should. You start to compensate in one way or another. And now you've got, now you've got a nagging injury or, you know, what was a nagging injury is now a legitimate injury. Um, it's just, there's, yeah, it's another thing where you could spin the wheel and like, or you could throw a dart at the whiteboard with your eyes closed and be like, yep, that's a good reason to be hydrated to a certain level and it it again it's all <laughs> reason reason number one through a hundred to hydrate well is the same as reason number one through a hundred to eat correctly um low hanging sorry. fruit too <laughs> <laughs> fucking right? drink water right <laughs> yeah. yeah um job, half Hunter. your body weight in ounces sorry this is freedom units so you're going to need to multiply by 2.2 .2 if you're going in kilos so if you weigh 200 pounds your baseline, if you eat a diet mostly of whole and unprocessed foods, um, would be 100 ounces. Um, that's, that's our baseline. That's where we're starting. It needs to be adjusted up first based on humidity. One of the reasons why we're potentially talking about it right now. Everybody's been steamed once or twice in the last few weeks. The gym's um, currently steaming. Set so we steam. need to adjust up for humidity and then we need to adjust up for exercise. Um, if you're listening to this and you eat like shit, um, that number is actually 75%. Um, so I'll, I'll go back to that. So if you weigh 200 pounds and you just eat junk food all day, you probably need about 150 ounces and that's without exercise. So DK Metcalf? Yes. DK Metcalf <laughs> needs 200 grand. Well, the funny thing is, day. okay, so here's what's interesting. <laughs> Very healthy people get signals from their body to do what they're supposed to do i've watched a day in the life of athletes that eat just like candy and shit and there's cases of water everywhere <laughs> he taught lamar odom's like i drink like three four bottles of water per bag of candy and i'm like dude's got it <laughs> it's also some crack magic mixed in, but <laughs> magic recipe <laughs> Fucking but crack. like they're always they Sweet always fish. have a ton of water, water. too they always have a ton of water. I don't know who taught them that, if it's their body. A little body. bit of crack, Anyways. a little bit of sweet fish, water. Um, okay, so this is another thing that you can play around with. So humidity's up, like we can just bump that number up to 75% and see how we feel. Um, it's another thing that you can play with, but that's our baseline. Um, and one of the things that if you are going to compete in the sport – at the semifinals level or the CrossFit Games level, or if you're going to peel off and do um, any endurance sports, you have to do a sweat test. Like 100% have to do a sweat test. In the conditions that you will be competing, you need to go exercise for an hour. We uh, we typically do it on the bike. I think that's... Do we do it on the bike or did we run last year, Sure, I don't remember. Or it was two years ago. Uh, Two years. It was two years ago. Yeah. But did we run or bike? I don't remember if we just did our run and then came back in. No, it was just a run. Matter. It was just run. It was just run. Yeah. Um, but again, the the 
the thing that you will be doing will also help for that number to be accurate. So you get naked, you weigh yourself, I'm into put it. your clothes no, back on if you Not want. Anymore. Oh, Carter, you can't come with me. Go for a run. <laughs> I already got, I got the camera set up. Get on the run, bike, do. running naked, sweat for an naked. hour, and Sweating then go naked. measure how much weight you lost. Oh. <laughs> Oh, 30, 30 pounds. <laughs> Two inches. Um, I mean, 285 <laughs> pound athlete. It is not um, unlikely for them to lose three to six pounds um, with the humidity at a certain place. Now, here's one thing that's interesting about this. If you lose three to six pounds of water and you go drink six pounds of water, what's going to happen? My tummy hurts. Your your brain will explode. <laughs> you know, I mean, will you drown well, yourself? The, the funny thing is, it's you actually worse. The hypo, yeah. hyper, hyponatremia. No, you, you piss a lot. So to account oh, yeah, for that, terrible. so to account for that, you're actually supposed to replace 125 to 150 percent of that number. Now, of oh, course, so you want it's more. not. Yeah, you want more because you're just going to piss it out as you go through that. Um, so. Worth just talking about ways that that number could fluctuate. This is on top of that 50% number, right? That 50% number was our baseline. Now we're going to go back in and add this. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is very important is that you don't sweat water. You sweat sweat. <laughs> so you basically, the, the, the thing that's used a lot that sounds disgusting is you need to drink sweat. Um, so another thing that a very high level athlete 100 percent has to do is to order one of the sweat patches and you can get those from gatorade there's a bunch of different companies that do it but basically you throw a patch on your skin you do that same test and then i think the gatorade one is like maybe like you scan like a qr code i don't know exactly um but it will give you your your sweat rate so obviously there are people who are losing a half a pound and people who are losing seven pounds like massive difference there um and then there are people who over the course of an hour are only sweating out 500 milligrams of sodium and there are people who are sweating out two grams so 2,000 milligrams of sodium so again at a high level you really got to make sure that you're going in and taking care of these things um one one way to sort of combat this sort of thing um, and make it less aggressive um, and I know that I'm kind of bouncing around here, so this would be an episode where you'd want the pen and the paper, is your body weight divided by 30 is the ounces you should drink every 15 minutes during exercise. So someone right now can can do that. So 5.9 ounces of water for me. I'm 178 pounds divided by yep. 30 is 5.9 ounces. Shut the fuck up, Sherbrooke. <laughs> <laughs> Probably more like 175 after my sweaty workout. So, so six, six. About, about six ounces per. Yep, about six ounces of water. So if you're going into a, if you were going into a CrossFit class on a humid day like today, you would sort of ask yourself what you thought. You know, hey, is this? Am I going to be sweating for an hour during this mm -hmm. class? I should probably bring 24 ounces of water with me, um, and then. Obviously, the sodium, that's something that we just talked about. You just divide that into the number. So if you did your sweat test and you came out at a, a lot of people come out at about a gram um, in an hour if of, of like after intense exercise, you would just need to make sure that like in that 24 ounces, you had a gram um, or if it was a shorter bout of exercise, if it was 15 minutes, you're just dividing by four, that sort of thing. How many ounces of water do you have hundred during your workout? I think I had about two. <laughs> I, I took, took one a couple sip. I took took some I was coaching right before so I drank probably close to a blender bottle during my workout like mm. two sips probably two sips yeah say I took a, a sip after that's round why one, it's so because like how often can a CrossFit athlete do that and that's why it's so fucking important to be hydrated to yeah. start hydrated start above to drink baseline. the amount of water up to that point that you should that is so incredibly important. And the good thing is, if you do the every 15 minutes thing, you get to subtract that from your sweat loss number. So that's, yeah, like, we you also, don't... We also just know, like, sorry, just the for to convince anybody if you needed it, it's like, it depends on what you read or where you look, but, like, as little as, like, 5% dehydration 
may result in like 40 percent loss in performance like there it's a it's a it's a, a disproportionately massive drop in performance yes. with the smallest amount to of clarify five percent though is your body weight it's not like i'm this much hydrated so those numbers are based sure, on okay your, yeah five percent of my body yep. weight right de dehydration yep yeah but again they see people weigh that way 185 pounds go lose seven pounds going for a jog for an hour um so <laughs> yeah that's a lot that's that's pretty brutal there um and then the other thing you don't sweat out glucose but you're burning the glucose like that's another thing that's super important and it's no surprise that like basically your if if uh, there are a lot of athletes sure being probably being one of them that would need somewhere around a liter of water in a crossfit class that's like 33 ounces is that right yeah 32 33 somewhere there yeah 32 33 ounces um if you did the amount of like Gatorade powder that was needed for a liter, you'd get in the realm of 60 grams of carbohydrates, which is what someone like Sherb would probably get rid of during that amount of exercise. That's what yeah, it's, it, and it's funny. It just gives me flashbacks to run the marathon a couple of years ago where, you know, you have the chews in your pocket, the carbohydrate chews, you're stopping at every water station, you sodium load and hydrate the night before. And I think around mile 15 or 16, I completely dried out. So I had to stop at every single water station, drink two cups of the Gatorade they had mixed and two cups of water. And by the time I got to the next one, which was about a mile away, I was already dried out again. Like yeah. every time I stopped, I had stopped sweating by the time I had got to that station. And like, obviously the marathon is significantly longer than a CrossFit session is typically or a CrossFit class is. But, you know, it's just funny to think about like- But those little segments give you a view into what could happen to yeah. you in a class. Like you feel it when it happens. Oh, like we've sure. had the the running tests recently and like I did one of them very dehydrated and I could, the pavement was so fucking hot. I could not get out of the one eighties, even if I fucking walked and like, that's not normal, like for anyone, even if someone of my level of conditioning. So it's like, what the hell is going on here? And your body sweats to, to cool itself off, to get its core temperature down, to stop being like insanely catabolic. So Again, like really thinking about it from that standpoint is very important. Yeah, it's fucking, it sucks when you dry out. Like, you know, your body is shutting down, but also you just like, you can't cool yourself down. You overheat. There's just so many compounding effects and it's just a, it's a negative feedback loop where it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse. And, you know, if you don't stop and correct it, that's where, you know, obviously not worried about in a CrossFit class, but if you do longer endurance events where it could be a serious problem where, you know, you see these high level athletes who, our phenomenal athletes just not have the right strategy or just not do enough to get ahead of it. And they get to pull out of races. They get to pull out of events because they didn't prepare themselves correctly or they didn't have enough experience to know what was actually going to happen on game day. What percentage of the amount of liquids that an athlete needs do you think that they would consume if they did it based on thirst alone? They've done this study. So they've given athletes the exact amount of water that they need over the course of a day. Uh, and then they've asked athletes to only drink when they're thirsty. What percentage of that 25. water do you think they drink? I'd say 50. 25. Yeah, it's 50. So it's, but it's 25. Wow. So they, it's the 25% of body weight in ounces someone will drink in a day. So half of what they're supposed to, um, if it's just thirst. And one of the reasons is because the, the balance isn't typically there. Like they almost all endurance athletes need flavor, salt, and glucose for their body to continue to basically agree to drink that down because it's what it needs. If you have, if, you know, if your concentration, if your mix, you know, around workouts is too diluted, then you piss way too much and you dehydrate yourself. And if it's too concentrated, you shit yourself. Um, so if you have GI distress from what you're doing, there's a pretty good chance that you're overdoing it on the sodium, um, and potentially the carbohydrate. And if you are like just peeing and peeing and peeing over and over, then you need to get typically get more sodium in there. But sometimes it is also the carbohydrate your body absorbs. Um, that's why like people get people in the like whatever paleo keto community get mad because liquid IV, which doesn't have enough of any of the other other ingredients. Spoiler Tastes alert. Tastes good though. 
tastes good, but it's got <laughs> yeah. carbs in it. And people are like, no, I'm going to die. And it's like, well, you actually get hydration into your tissues more with glucose. Um, so for, for anyone who's, who's terrified of the seven grams of sugar in a liquid IV, it's going to be okay. You're going to be more hydrated. Um, it sticks like 20 grams of sugar, but I get the point. Yeah. <laughs> Is it really? There's that much in it? I think it's, yeah, a, it's like 13 it's, grams. I believe I know all gets it. So I there's so many versions more. of it now too, though, because of those complaints, there's like diet liquid IV. <laughs> Fuck. Sign me up. All right. What other, let's see, what other anecdotes do I have to try to convince people to drink water? Um, dehydration also causes perceptual strain. So there are athletes that can still perform at a given level and there is in significantly higher levels of pain while they're doing it. So basically like if you're in a window where you haven't lost enough body weight um, for that percentage drop that we talked about, but they aren't at optimal hydration and you know, you two are racing mm -hmm. each other and one of you is and one of you isn't the same amount of output would hurt significantly more if you did that. If we're talking about the sport of CrossFit and your ability to sustain what's going on between the ears is such a massive part uh, of it. And Hunter's you're hydrated. I'm not. Got it. Yes. That's what it's been <laughs> the whole time. It's just all, the that's kid's just always drinking fucking Super water. hydrated. <laughs> it's a cheat code. I mean, it makes Fuck. sense, right? Like you don't have yeah. to be a, you don't have to be an athlete or a CrossFitter to know that if you're fucking dehydrated, like how easily it is to get a headache or to feel groggy and feel like shit. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Liquid IV, you were right, Sherb, 13. But they right now, they're selling the Firecracker Popsicle flavored Liquid IV. So the What's red, that? white, and blue oh, fucking Dildo fuck, Popsicle. Dildo Popsicle. It says it, and they've got Popsicle never, right I, on there. It's a great, really good. what they call it, Dildo. Liquid <laughs> IV Popsicle. Yeah, it's the Dildo, dildo Popsicle. Dildo Popsicle. Fuck. That's, That's the next proper candy. hydrate flavor, Dildo Popsicle. Oh, uh, fuck. <laughs> that'd be an amazing label. Fuck, that'd be, Ted would have so much fun designing that. We'd get banned everywhere. <laughs> Ted's already designed it. It's in his files somewhere. <laughs> it's it's got to be. They have, the, have the billboard Popsicle. truck. Don't ban our product. Dildo oh, Popsicle flavor. so goddamn good. <laughs> All right. That's the best that I could do to convince people to actually measure. But will you guys do it? Like, how do we do it? That's the thing. I don't think I'm going to do it still. I want to. It just feels unnatural that every time that I drink water that I'm like, there's this many ounces. How do you do it? Do you I have mean, suggestions? Uh, yeah, fucking easy be, way. Be a, be, fucking, be a fucking grown up and if you want to win the CrossFit games, measure how much water you drink. I mean, the jokingly, <laughs> the thing I think of is like go back to like the uh, the bodybuilding gym where everyone's walking around with a fucking Ooh. gallon jug in their hand and literally just yep. draw the line in the jug that starts the day at what you're supposed to drink every single day and, and until that fucking jug is done... Like drink that fucking shit. Like how many it's ounces so in a gallon? Uh, 128, I think. Yeah, it's a little so bit I, much. Well, no, not not if you're exercising. Depends on who it is. Yeah. But just okay, so I can get behind that. So I put the minimum amount of water that I need to consume in a vessel that I can then dump into a regular water bottle, right? If you want to, sure. But I don't. You have, I'm every not. day that fucking bottle has to be emptied. Every day. I'm not I carrying swear. around that I'm, fucking yeah, I need estrogen. You to, I want you to fucking walk estrogen around pool. skim milk gallon. <laughs> gallon of skim. I had to have skim it at one point. Had to, you got to drink that. it too. You got to drink it I think first. I can handle That'll that. be your first 128 ounces of water. Oh, it's just it the skim sick milk. To my stomach. Gross. Skim milk. Yeah, skin, I mean, the answer, the, how do we do it is. Do it. How much do you care? That's, sure. that's what it comes down yep. to, right? It's like yeah. you prioritize it we know how important it is we know that the best athletes in the world are you know bringing fucking tupperware containers of their exact macronutrients to restaurants and making sure they're drinking enough water and they're performing well and if you're not then ask where you can move uh move coins from one basket to another and sound like a jfk the, speech move the needle <laughs> ask yeah, not welcome. where your coins are ask how hydrated <laughs> your your are. coins are <laughs> for you, for me. Talking about my gear, I think at some point I want to do a follow up episode with uh, an expert on this topic and go through sodium loading, carb loading, 
you know, how much fiber you should be taking in, in like regular times versus I know endurance athletes back way off of that. Um, so that they actually can absorb the glycogen and the carbs that they're eating, that sort of thing. Um, I think that would be a, you know, conversation 2.0 that relates to all of this stuff, because there are some fine tuning details that relate to performance directly. Um, and we've done the, we've done more than one supplement episode before. Um, that's something that we could potentially do again, but I think every once in a while checking back in on this conversation and starting at the end and saying, we have to get to a specific level of strength to body weight ratio that fits within the sport, a certain amount of lean body mass. Um, and then we start with calories in calories out and find out what is our, you know, uh, I'm getting a little big. I need to, to, to drop weight right now. What are my maintenance calories? What do I got to do to actually put on that mass that we talked about? Then we get into the protein, carbs, and fat, these ratios, um, where we feel the best, where we perform the best and definitely last but not least this thing that's just kind of glossed over a lot in these conversations is the piece of hydration and at the very least, can the listeners start to do 50% of their body weight in ounces every single day and just see like, hey, is this like a jump from where I was? Like, is this an improvement? Was I already there? You know, was I able to get to that just because of things like drinking protein shakes and drinking, you know, liquid carbs or, you know, electrolytes, you know, or am I way off? And this could be a massive performance enhancing thing. Um, especially with, you know, the ideas of linear progression. My mind just goes back to from training year round, dehydrated and underfueled. I'm going to do good. What would be good. the difference in a year of training in that opposite world on the other side of the coin? It'd be crazy. When you perform well, you get better. And then those things stack on top of each other and you get that compounding interest that you get from, you know, a thoughtful program, but over training, under fueling, under hydrating, all those things that we, that we see on a pretty regular basis from athletes are like just almost too simple to, to ignore and be like, what, how, how are we still here? Like someone that trains as hard as you do and puts the amount of effort in and cares as much about making it to the next level yet. This is what we're up to. Yeah. I just want to, I mean, I, the, why would you want to spend all that money and all that stuff that you don't need the supplements, the fucking special programming template. If the stuff that you're doing is not getting you the benefit you're hoping for, it's just a low barrier to entry. You have to drink water to survive. You have to eat food to survive. Why not make sure that they're both optimal for performance if performance is your goal. These final thoughts. I just didn't I mind. think, yeah, I think I did <laughs> mine too. Um, yeah, well, okay. One, I, I do want to make one caveat just for the listener. And I wish we had done this at the very beginning. And maybe it's implied when we we're saying competitive CrossFitter. Mm -hmm. the, the, what we just talked about are recommendations for a competitive CrossFitter. These are not recommendations for someone who comes in, takes a one hour affiliate class, you know, three to five days a week. They are not all that different but they are different and we're the gonna, funny thing is like, like with that math for me for instance my carb number is just normal and kind of low right it's like 200 something yeah <laughs> it's a very yeah, manageable that, number because of the amount of calories that i should eat so if you do the math luckily it does work out for most people okay well yeah all right either way i just want to caveat that for you yeah. know someone someone walks into affiliate class being like i heard brent fakowski ate 900 grams of sweet <laughs> potato so i'm fucking dialed well it's um, funny you say that hunter i had that conversation with someone because i put like rice in my meals like i i have vegetables and meat as the bulk and i still put pro i put some sort of carbohydrate like starch in my in my meals and they walk around and they say hey i know you guys like say that you know eat little of that why are you eating that i'm like i just want to give you a context like i pull up my watch and the watch tells you how many steps you take you know, one of the things I have on my watch face. <laughs> this is, is many... little of that. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it's, it's like, it says on like in a week, how much I watch. I'm like, I, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to take a photo of it on Saturday. Cause it resets every Saturday. Um, how far I walk. So I show this, this athlete. I'm like, I walked 61 miles last week in my life. Just whatever exercising, coaching class, whatever the fuck I did. I'm like that. 
is more walking than some people do in a like three month span. Like some people don't walk that much. They literally take 2000 steps a day. You know, I'm taking 15,000 steps a day. Like I'm literally walking eight times as much as anybody else. Like realize that when you're, you know, thinking about your diet, if you can't get away with that. Cause like, just because you see someone doing that doesn't mean you should do that, which is, I think ultimately what you're getting at here, you have to be smart about who you are as a person and realize what, what things apply to you and what things don't. Um, yeah. And so my final thoughts, I think is it, it, what we, whether there, there are a fuckload of different diets that are going to work for a lot of different people out there and diet. I fucking hate the word diet ways of eating lifestyle that's a, even lifestyle yeah because i ideally we're trying to build a lifestyle thing but if you're a competitive athlete like there, there's a definitely a bit of a t give and take there um but we know what the highest level competitors as kind of shallow as this sounds we know what the highest level competitors look like and like that's a pretty decent barometer for things like okay well i know most probably competitive crossfitters are sitting somewhere in like the 10 to maybe 15 percent body fat range and if you're not in that if you're fucking shredded mcgee or if you're carrying around a little bit extra body mass like we can we we know what those things visually look like and we can at least get a starting point for you from there but ultimately the it's it's just so it's going to be a lot of a little bit of guess and check uh, and just personal honesty making sure that you're actually recording you know recording what you're eating being honest about your intake levels and then being willing to to tinker with it because it is very much a personal experiment and n equals one sort of deal and what works for your training partner might not work for you and i think that's an important caveat too just to to kind of round that out yeah for sure and i think that that's you know potentially a conversation that we could also have on this podcast is the weaving your way through that as an affiliate coach because it's yeah, complicated sure. because the, you know, starting with calories in calories out can be super helpful, right? Like if we're not going to change someone's, you know, how, exactly how they eat overnight, at least like capping the number in terms of like the amount of energy that they're putting into their body, um, would be a, a really great place to start. But then the other numbers don't live in a vacuum because someone might some some people just man they get some carbs and their blood sugar gets all out of whack and they feel like they need more that sort of thing and they're unable to help themselves because the calories in calories out thing with the macronutrient breakdown would work for basically everyone but if you can't do it it won't work right like yeah. and that's where a lot of these other things come into play your intermittent fasting it works because it cuts down calories it also cuts down on muscle mass specifically lean lean body mass um you know if you go from fucking 7 p.m to 1 p.m without any protein like it's gonna be a problem like yeah you know, a lot of people see that so they see the body weight reduction but also lean mass reduction that sort of thing so yeah um, but I, I i do think the for like not to keep going on the uh, affiliate athlete thing but the what you said about the whole and unprocessed foods that that i would blanket across you know the sure. entire population and in a lot of ways totally. what we were talking about is like when you eat those high quality foods the, they're just naturally more satiating especially with a higher micronutrient like micronutrients help make you feel full if you are eating garbage you are probably going to eat a lot of it and want to continue eating a lot of it you fill up on you know high quality protein and fat you just physically aren't going to want to eat more and you'll, you'll end up satisfying yourself that way true can we do it yeah Cheer. thank you for tuning in to another episode of the misfit podcast thank you to our show sponsors sharpen the use your favorite athlete code properfuel.co use the code word misfit misfitathletics.com for your, all of your individual programming needs and teammisfit.com for your affiliate programming needs See you next week.